Well, my name is Pankaj Mishra and I'm a writer and I've just published this book called Age of Anger, History of the Present, which is essentially about um, the global craziness that we see today every time we pick up a newspaper. Demagogues, uh, terrorists, um, various far-right political movements on the rise everywhere. And it's, so it's, it's an attempt to understand this particular phenomena historically and in, in, in other ways as well. Can you tell a little bit more about what is going on in terms of the age of anger in India? Well, it was what actually made me want to write this book. Right. It was the arrival in 2014 of a man who should ideally be in prison uh, and he became the Prime Minister of this country. Um, and he's now the most powerful Prime Minister this country has had in decades. So that made me think that we need to analyze this phenomena slightly more deeply than, say, journalistic analysis, that uh, we need to go back to history, we need to look at how demagogues in other countries have flourished, what kind of false promises they have offered to the voters, to the masses at large, and how they're able to acquire power and hold on to it. So in many ways, this book is prompted by my Indian experience, and while I was writing it, um, Modi's or people like Modi started to appear in different parts of the world and again I saw people falling for succumbing to strongmen who they thought would deliver uh, to them on the promises that various ruling classes had made in the past, in the recent past and, and, and not delivered. You know, in one sense I still am loyal to an enlightenment, one enlightenment idea, uh, which is that individuals still have it in their capacity to go, to go, to do good. And that is the kind of power that I can still trust today. Everything else, the power of corporations, the power of governments, that is something to be distrusted, especially at this moment. And I think we've seen, uh, modern history has produced ample evidence that the kind of expansion of power that is that is the modern project really in many ways uh, that has led to all kinds of calamities all kinds of disasters it has overwhelmed individual capacities to do good and so i think what we need to recover at this point is this 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 early ideal which is individual autonomy individual freedom the individual capacity to do good I think um, intellectuals, which as a class really start to emerge in the late 18th century, and I try to show in the book right from the very beginning, they are allied with power, often with despotic power, with the intention that their ideas might be actualized, might be realized by powerful people, might be institutionalized. And I think that's a very dangerous illusion. Um, and we've seen that um, over and over again, how intellectuals thinking that they can shape political power and that their ideas can be implemented fruitfully in different parts of the world has led to one disaster after another, whether it's neoconservative intellectuals most recently advocating the invasion of Iraq and the imposition of democracy in the Middle East or indeed any number of modernization theorists running around the world saying we have the right formula for progress and development in these societies and, and, and uprooting large numbers of people, you know, creating essentially all the ingredients for violent revolutions such as the kind we saw in Iran, for instance, uh, after two or three decades of boshed modernization by intellectual elites. So I think uh, we have to be more suspicious of this figure, the intellectual. And it's not easy for me uh, to say because, you know, I am one of those uh, people I criticize. But I do think if we need to move forward at this point, all of us, and I include myself, have to examine our own assumptions. What makes Alexander Hefson, with whom you definitely sympathize, uh, the kind of intellectual uh, you think he's worthwhile uh, to read. I think Hudson uh, was doing all the things um, that I would ideally expect intellectuals to do, which is to criticize their own work, criticize their own ideas, 
and to constantly re-examine their assumptions. You know, here is a man who comes to Europe from Russia, wanting to learn the secrets of progress from Europe, from European intellectuals, and quickly realizes that they have very little to teach him. Yeah. That Russia needs to follow its own particular path, uh, shaped by its own history, by its own circumstances. That this notion that everyone can progress in the same sort of way, the kind of formula that the Europeans are offering, they are deeply, deeply defective. Um, so in, in, in many cases, it's very easy for someone like myself from India to identify with Edson because he comes from a country that is supposed to be backward, that's supposed to be pre-modern, barbarous, and he wants modernity of, 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 of some kind or other. And he realizes that the modernity that is on offer in 19th century Europe is not what he wants. And if Russia does fall for it, it would be catastrophic for Russia. The kind of transformation thinking I'm, think, I'm, I'm asking for is not something that can be done by technocrats or by people in Silicon Valley devising solutions for general world improvement or uplift or progress. I think uh, we have to examine our own role in the world as it exists today at a level of individuals. And then we have to think about devising modes of politics and economy which are not fraught with the kind of political risks that we've seen recently. And also uh, that are environmentally sustainable. You know, this is the biggest question that faces us today of, of climate change. Whether hundreds of millions of Indians and Chinese can live at the same level of material affluence um, that a few million Europeans and Americans have enjoyed remains an open question. And I think we can say safely the answer is no at this point. So. Is our progress going to be environmentally sustainable? Do we not need transformational thinking about the good life? What constitutes the good life? There are diverse ways of conceiving it, and I think we've been told that there's only one, and that alone calls for transformational thinking.